today's work session. Clerk, will you go ahead and call us to order? Or no, I call us to order. Will you call the roll? Agent. Here. Clegg. Here. Holly Barton. Here. Sanchez. Here. Thompson. Here. Woodings. Five present, one absent. Great, thank you. Um, first up, we have an airport update from Rebecca who, yep, she's in the Zoom screen. Uh, but just before um, Rebecca Hupp takes over the director of the airport, um, Oh, um, Clark, will you please note for the record that Council Member Woodings is, is with us? Yes, Madam Mayor. So today, I'm not going to steal Rebecca's thunder in terms of the announcements and the opportunity to cover that. Um, but one of the important things we're going over today is the incentive program and want to do that because of the importance of using the airport as an economic driver. And people want to come here. Our folks need to head out for work as people start to travel more. Um, and Rebecca and her team at the airport um, with our economic development team and partners throughout the community are working hard to create an incentive program that will deliver the flights that we need to get people where they need to go. So thanks, Rebecca, for joining us today. My pleasure. Happy to be here. I'm going to share my screen. All right. Please tell me that you can see a PowerPoint presentation. We can. All right, fantastic. Thank you. And I will go through this because I know that the council has a very busy schedule and lots of things to review, but I thought it would be good to just talk about where we are today, talk about the Air Service Incentive Program, as the mayor had mentioned, and then talk about our BOI upgrade program and the 2021 projects that we'll be working on this year. So I recently had an opportunity to meet with council member Sanchez and she started our conversation by asking me what were the three things that she should know about the airport, you know, very broad strokes more than anything else. And I think the three things are that, yes, the pandemic has been challenging, but because of the foundation that we have at the Boise Airport, um, both fiscally and operationally, as well as with our team, our foundation is strong. And so we're positioned to come out of this pandemic well. We will continue to grow based on growth in the Treasure Valley, and we all know that Boise is growing rapidly, but we are growing rapidly with Boise, but also with CUNA and STAR and Meridian and Nampa and all of the other surrounding towns. We are their airport, so our growth will be compounded. And so in order to meet that growth, we need to continue to invest in the airport to meet the needs of our community, and we need to continue to invest in our team so we have the right people doing the right things at the right time. This is probably not a surprise to any one of you, but the Boise metro area continues to grow significantly faster than all uh, most other areas in the country. And we're continued to project it, continued projected growth um, through 2030 of about 21%. That information is courtesy of the uh, Boise Valley Economic Partnership. And as the mayor mentioned, We've had some exciting announcements recently. And if you'd asked me um, at the beginning of the year, if I thought 2021 would bring new air service announcements on the heels of a decrease in passengers of about 50%, my answer would have been probably not. However, um, in 2020, we had a number of new announcements and I won't read them all to you because you can all read, uh, but we added a significant amount of service. And what we're seeing is that the airlines are changing how they're evaluating routes. And the pandemic has created new opportunities where business travel has decreased in some markets that's been high volume, high frequency. Um, it's less volume and less frequency, which is opening the opportunity for airlines to proceed and start new markets. And they're also looking at markets that are destinations and that are leisure and business. And so we're looking at two new routes that were announced so far in 2021, Allegiant to Nashville, which will be twice weekly, and then JetBlue, which is a giant win for our community um, to JFK. And we've never had nonstop service to New York. And not only is New York an amazing destination, but it also is a hub and it allows us to bring in a new carrier. So it's a trifecta. Um, and we can't talk about the airport without talking about our fiscal responsibility. And so I just wanna go over a couple of things. Uh, revenues were down 25% compared to 2019, but that's compared to employments being down 38%. Uh, 
we still finished the year with a 1.2 net operating income. And we had about $19 million of CARES funding, 10.6 million we have used and drawn down in 2020, and we'll have 8.2 million to draw down in 2021. And now most recently we received an additional allocation of 6.3 million in the latest round of funding. And one of the reasons that Boise continues to be attractive um, in addition to our growing economy and the fact that we're a great destination is Boise is an affordable airport for airlines to operate. So it's easy for them or easier, I should say, it's not easy. I'm sure they would tell you it's not easy to start service to a new city, but it's easier to start service to Boise and all other things being equal, our competitive cost advantage um, makes us a more attractive place to add service than other destinations. So talking about air service, and we'll get to the incentive program here pretty quick. This is just a recap. We had 58% growth in the seven years leading up to 2020. You can see that we exceeded our forecast for 2025 and 2019, and we were on a path for significant growth. And then, of course, we had the pandemic, just like every place else in the country, and we saw significant decreases in passenger travel in 2020, although I would note that we still were about 10% better than our peers. Passengers were down 52% compared to 2019. I think nationally, passengers were down over 60%. So this brings us to our air service incentive program. And we wanted to update our air service incentive program, recognizing that recruiting new air service is gonna be more challenging, uh, of course, post pandemic, because that presents its own challenges, but also because the places where we're recruiting air service to are now further away. There, we, you know, we've, we have service to most of our top 20 destinations. And so we wanna recognize that uh, the, the service ahead is going to be harder to obtain. We also wanna differentiate markets, meaning not all markets are created the same. All air service pretty much is great air service and we're excited to have it. But New York is a far more attractive destination than Payne Field and Seattle. So we wanna focus on connectivity. We wanna focus on new destinations. And we also want to incentivize new airlines. There's not that many new airlines that we can recruit to our community. And we want to make sure that we provide an incentive for them to come to Boise. Finally, we want to be competitive with our peers. So if there's another airport that's offering an incentive, we want to make sure that our incentives are competitive. And of course, we need to make sure that we're continuing to comply with FAA regulations. So the target markets that we've identified are based on the largest origin and destination markets, markets that provide hub connectivity, markets that have an increased risk because of the route length. And then we also have identified interstate connectivity as a priority for our community, recognizing that Boise is the capital of the state and that uh, significant business relies on that intrastate connectivity. And these are the state, the cities that we've identified as potential target markets. And I apologize if this is a little bit small, hopefully you had an opportunity to review this in your packet and I will not read it to you word for word. I'm happy to answer questions, but really we've, I, we've divided the incentives into a couple of different segments. First, a um, incentive for a new airline and then seasonal service both target market and um, just a regular unserved market, and then year round target market and year round unserved seasonal. So really trying to differentiate between the types of services that would be introduced and also again, providing that incentive for new airlines. Madam Mayor. Sure, go ahead. I'm sorry, Rebecca, quick question on the incentives. Do they stack? So for instance, if someone is a new airline and they're serving a new unserved target market, are they looking at potentially 75,000 in incentives? Like how does that work? Yes, they do stack because again, recognizing it's easier for an existing airline. So for example, for Alaska or Southwest or one of our other carriers, it's easier for them 
to add a new route than it is to bring a whole new operation to Boise. So we want to incentivize the market, but we also want to incentivize the potential for new airline. But keep in mind, four carriers control about 80% of all domestic passenger travel in the U.S. And today we have eight airlines in Boise. So that tells you that there's really not that many additional new carriers that we could recruit. And I would note that um, the incentive does not start until a carrier has served our market for 90 days. So the, some of the new service that we're seeing that's only 60 days in duration does not currently qualify for this. And they've decided to come to Boise anyway. So this is something that tips the scale in our favor, it's not probably going to be a deciding factor for an airline. All right, and then while I have you here, I did wanna talk about um, our BOI upgrade program. We talked about it quite a bit in 2019, 2020. We paused on a number of projects, but as you recall, we have a $200 million upgrade program that we're starting to embark on. And that project is still, those projects are still continuing to move forward. So the very first step is the relocation of the Idaho Transportation Department hangar. It's currently located adjacent to the parking garage. And we have built and constructed a new hangar on the south side, which is accessed from Gowan Road over near Sky West. So that is the first step is relocating uh, the tenants from the existing hangar to the new hangar so we can use that space for a future car rental facility. One of the projects that we worked on in 2020 and we will continue to work on in 2021 is a surface animal relief area, a lactation room and a family restroom. We currently have a family restroom. As you go through security screening, this will expand that. We do have a mamava pod um, that is there for as a lactation room. This will create a more permanent room and also one that has running water and electricity. And then the service area, uh, re service animal relief area will also go in that area. And it's as you come through security screening right on the right where that existing mama va pod is, is where this will all be going in that area. And so we did design in 2020 and we will do construction in 2021. It is currently out for bid and this project is going to be paid for with the passenger facility charge. And when we think about timing for these projects, I feel a little bit like we're trying to thread a needle because we wanna make sure that we have the facilities and infrastructure in place when we need them. And we don't wanna have them sitting idle. So this is just a quick glance at where passenger numbers have been over the last five years. And you can see that in 2018, we were at just under 2 million passengers. That's when we started opening the economy parking lot year round. And so while we were planning construction in 2020 for the employee parking garage, and while we desperately needed it in 2019, really we were beyond capacity already in 2018. So you can see in 2020, we projected 50% of our passengers 2021, we think we will continue to grow and recover potentially at 65%. We think that's fairly conservative. We're hopeful that it will be more than that, but you know, we'll have to wait and see how the pandemic develops um, and how effective the vaccines are. And so we expect that by 2022 or 2023, we will be at the same level of passenger employments that we were at in 2018, which is really our target. So recognizing that it takes multiple years to build this type of facility, we're projecting an early start of either late summer this year or early fall for the parking garage. Madam Mayor. Yes, go ahead. Thank you. Um, Rebecca, thank you for um, sharing these projections with us. I'm just curious about the assumptions that kind of underlie the projections is there an assumption that, um, I don't know, can you just kind of explain to me what the assumptions are that, um, that uh, I guess. We're, we're basing this on industry forecasts that are projecting that passenger travel will return to 2019 levels by 2023. 
And so given what we are seeing in the industry and also in, in Boise that showing that we are recovering more quickly, our passenger travel did not dip as significantly as what we've seen nationwide. And also we are seeing more additions of air service than what our peers are seeing. So for those reasons, we think that our recovery will most likely be quicker. But again, this is in line with what we're projecting for national forecast trends. Okay, um, so. may I have a follow-up, Madam Mayor? Yeah, go ahead. Um, is that, I guess I'm, I wanna get a little bit more granular than that. Is that thinking that business travel is going to pick up? Is that thinking that people are gonna be tired of being cloistered at home and are gonna to wanna to travel for pleasure? What What is that granular level of projection looking like? The general thinking is that leisure travel will return prior to business travel. So I think we're going to see more leisure travel in 2021 with more of the business travel coming back in 2022 and 2023. Excellent, thank you. Yeah, thank you for those questions. So we're thinking that it will take a couple of years to build the parking garage. We also have to recognize that when we do this uh, construction, it will actually remove an entire parking lot for employee parking and it will reduce the surface parking for public parking by 300 spaces. So we are currently in design of the public parking garage and we are at about 65%. It's been to design review already. The design will be five stories. It'll add almost 1200 spaces. It will also include a new exit lane toll plaza and office space. And again, we expect the design will be completed in summer 2021 and we will continue to monitor the current parking statistics. So the number of overnight stays to make sure that we time this as close as possible to when we think we'll need it. But again, we're trying to project forward at least two years. The next project that will be completed will be the car rental facility. And we are expecting that we'll be awarding these contracts in March of this year. We've gone through the RFP process um, and this will include the design, bid and construction services. And this is the facility that is going where the existing ITD hangar is, where the original ITD hangar is, I should say, adjacent to the parking garage. And that will allow us to relocate all of the car rentals into this garage. So that way we'll be able to expand the concourse. So preliminary cost and funding, the overall estimates for the project are about $200 million for the entire program. And the program, just as a reminder, will be funded with a variety of sources, general revenue bonds, which will be backed by airport revenue. The passenger facility charges, which are the passenger fees that you see on your airline tickets that the airline collects and then remits to the airport. The customer facility charge, is, which is very similar, it's actually a fee that's on your rental car contract and those funds are dedicated to car rental facilities. And then airport revenue would be used for projects that are not eligible for one of these other funding sources, but there would be no general fund dollars used on this development. So that is the very quick overview and I am happy to answer any additional questions. Thank you, Rebecca. Let's see, it looks like council president, did you have something? You were unmuted for a moment. Thank you. Um, yes, thank you, Mayor McLean. Uh, Rebecca, quick question. The um, employees are now parking outside near the parking garage, you note that the new parking garage will take up much of that. Uh, we had a employee parking garage also scheduled. Will they park in the new garage while the employee parking garage is getting built or where else will they park? So we have multiple parking locations for employees. Some do park adjacent to the existing garage. Some park in uh, a lot that's adjacent to the airfield and near the car rentals. The intent with building the public garage first is that 
it will give us maximum flexibility in that employees would be able to park in there if we needed that additional space for employees while we're waiting for passenger traffic to come back. Okay. And while the new Thank you. employee garage would be being built. Thank you. That's an excellent point. Thank you very much. All right. Well, thank you, Rebecca, for joining us. Appreciate it. All right. Thank you. It's wonderful to see all of you. I look forward to when we can actually be together in person. Very soon. Very soon. Take care. Thank you. All right. Next up, we have a lot of people. Um, Stephen, hi there. Um, Stephen Hunt, Mr. Hunt from v Valley Regional Transit. And then on Zoom and then in the building here, we have um, both Karen Gallagher and Brie Brush to um, go through with us um, a presentation on public transit. And if you'll remember, this is, and tonight we'll have a public hearing, um, but we do this an annually now because of the council's commitment to sending funds to VRT. And what, something that we've asked our team here to do this year is to help us um, think about how we make progress on some of the larger Boulder initiatives, but then also make good on the public's interest in one, the investments that we make, um, but two, the impact that they should have for the city of Boise um, from a fiscal responsibility and transparency perspective. So I don't know, is Mr. Hunt going first? You guys going first? What's, okay, great. Stephen, it sounds like your, your plan is to go first. So why don't you go ahead, Stephen Hunt from VRT. Thank you, Madam Mayor, members of the council. Glad to be here. Um, Stephen, you're, could you up your volume just a tiny bit? At least in here, it's tough to hear you. Can you hear me better now? Oh, that's better. Yeah, thank you. Sure. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here. I'm going to be sharing a presentation. So let me get that up. So hope you're seeing that screen now. Each year, as the mayor mentioned, VRT presents to the city of Boise on what it accomplished the prior year and provides a brief look ahead on what we hope to accomplish in the coming year. And that information is all used in, uh, in budget inf to inform budget development as we go into FY22. 2020 was a, a challenging year, but we wanted to touch on four points here. First, highlights of how we were able to navigate the COVID crisis um, and still make progress on a number of City of Boise priorities and how we were able to take advantage of the CARES resources which were made available to us. We'll touch on the performance review of how uh, 2020 looked from a ridership and on-time performance perspective perspective and then we'll also do a brief look ahead both in 2021 initiatives as well as uh, farther out. So beginning with 2020 highlights, the we were able to make Im several improvements on the best in class corridor. So these are our State Street, Fairview and Vista. And uh, we were able to improve Saturday and evening services on all of those routes, extending them to operate later in into the evening. On State Street, we expanded peak frequencies. Um, we also were able to make progress on the State Street alternative analysis, which looked at paths between Whitewater and State and downtown Boise at the Main Street Station. Uh, that's part of our ongoing processes of building out the State Street corridor. And we continued to coordinate with our State Street partners with the executive, uh, with the executive team where we were able which includes members of the city of Boise, Ada County, Ada County Highway District, Garden City, Eagle, all in an effort to ensure that we, again, make progress on uh, building State Street into a, into a state, into a street with heavy transit emphasis. Other initiatives that we were able to complete this year include uh, beginning construction on the electric bus charging infrastructure out at the Orchard facility. So that's something that we've been pretty excited about. So bringing electric vehicles to Ada County, that those will take delivery of the first of those uh, this spring. And we will be, we're in the process right now of completing the charging infrastructure out at Orchard. We made improvements to 28 bus stops across the city to, to 
better accommodate to meet ADA requirements, improving curb ramps as well as shelters and other amenities, making that environment safer and better for our passengers. We were awarded 2.1 million in federal funds, competitive funds to expand and transition the orchard maintenance facility to accommodate electric vehicles as well as planned growth. We launched CityGo to coordinate travel demand into downtown Boise. We updated our, our paper schedules to better communicate to the public what transit connects you to, how to use transit. And at a, so at a glance, they can see the value that transit brings to their, uh, to their travel. We also prepared a mobile first website update, which makes critical information easier for passengers to, to get at. In addition to those projects, we, we did launch, plan and launch an on-demand transit service in Canyon County, which is based on providing trips to and from different locations in Nampa and Caldwell. And those are based, are routed on demand. This has been an interest in the Treasure Valley for some time to look at alternative ways of delivering service. And so we will be using what we learned from this project in Canyon County and how it could be applied to maybe some lower density or, or less lower performing areas in Ada County. In addition to, I mean, the, the biggest thing of 2020 obviously was just the impact of COVID-19. And that hit pretty hard about five months into the fiscal year. We took a number of actions to keep the public and the riding, the riders safe. We temporarily closed Main Street Station and we suspended our fare collection in order to be able to maintain social distancing and discourage passenger driver interactions. We've since installed uh, screens there to again keep to limit any kind of transmission between oper operators and passengers. Also required face masks. We increased um, vehicle and facility disinfecting. So a lot more cleaning went on during, has gone on since, since COVID began. And we launched remote working for all, all employees that could do remote working. And we launched a public safety uh, safe travels campaign. So each uh, biweekly, we would send out newsletters to the public about the, what has been going on in public transit, what VRT and, and our partners have been doing to ensure that people are able to continue to get where they need to go uh, during, during the COVID crisis. In addition to that, uh, in the federal government passed the Coronavirus Aid Relief and Economic Security Act, the CARES Act, which included emergency funding for public transportation and VRT received 12.9 million in CARES funding for transit services in Ada County. And we worked with the VRT board to prioritize those funds to cover first direct response to maintain current operations. And we also uh, looked at what we, could, what we could do to improve resiliency of our services as, and make make transit more resilient to any kind of uh, pandemic in the future. So in we worked with the VRT board to approve priorities for that funding and the roughly ten and a half million dollars that was programmed for operations from the CARES Act was used to offset or offset local contra service contributions and uh, within the Ada County area. And we've been working with each of those local jurisdictions to identify how to prioritize those local funds to meet uh, regional and local needs. Specifically for the city of Boise, we've been working with, with local staff to, to, pro, to reprogram about 6.1 million in funds from the city of Boise to go towards improving the best in class service, particularly on State Street as described in the Boise Transportation Action Plan. Gonna look now at 2020 performance. And when we, when, when we look at FY 2020 ridership, um, we, 
there were a lot of things going on. There are four things to keep in mind as we go through this, um, because it, if I were to tell you that we had 1.4% increase in ridership in FY 2020, uh, that that seems a little counterintuitive. When in fact, that that is the result. And there are four, uh, four reasons for that that I want to speak to. Uh, first is we, COVID hit in really in March is when we first started seeing the major impacts in terms of ridership. So we had a solid five months of ridership going into COVID. We get about 60%, historically about 60% of our ridership in the first half of the year. And in 2020, we were, we were posting significant uh, increases in ridership up until COVID hit. The other thing that was happening is we, transition from using the GFI fare box as our reporting mechanism to using the automatic passenger counters. And it's been the industry-wide, it's been the experience that you see between a 10 and a 20% increase in ridership as you transition from the fare box as your ridership data source and going to APCs. And so we saw that as well. So those were those two things were positive vectors in our ridership for 2020 and um, resulted and actually a, a positive growth for the year. That, however, is not to, shouldn't confuse anybody about the impacts of, of COVID-19 and what it did to our ridership. If we look at it on a month to month basis, you can see um, how that plays out. So for the first half of the year, we were, we were ahead of schedule compared to 2019. We saw some significant declines in over the summer and into the fall and more kind of important and disturbing as we look into 2021, the impacts of COVID haven't, haven't uh, as you all know, have not gone away. And so when we look in terms of when will we see kind of the bigger impact for ridership, we expect to see that in our FY21 ridership. And we would be down anywhere between 20 and 50% we would expect. Madam Mayor. Sure, go ahead. Thank you. Um, just to clarify, so the chart we're looking at now with the red from fiscal year 19, that includes the undercount? Yes. Now that we have a better system and we're more accurately able to count, that's reflected in 2020? Madam Mayor, yes, that's correct. Okay, thank you. We also saw that ridership though um, kind of retract from all parts of the city. If we look at, this is pre-COVID ridership at a stop level and you can see the best in class corridors show up there, the larger circles re representing more ridership and you can see that on State Street and on Vista and you can see that on Fairview as well. Those three best in class corridors are all areas where we see a lot of ridership. When we look at the post COVID ridership, you see a retraction across the city, but you can still see State Street and, and Vista showing up as higher ridership corridors. The other interesting thing to note about ridership that occurred during uh, COVID was just the, the significant impact that it had on peak ridership. So people traveling to and from work. When COVID hit, we essentially, typically you see two peaks and a valley in the middle of the day when you're looking at daily ridership. And what happened when, when we went through COVID is that flipped into what, just a hill. Our, our highest ridership was in the middle of the day. And we saw that actually our weekend ridership did not decline nearly as much as our weekday ridership. So it, there certainly was a shift in terms of, of where we saw the ridership happening. And um, we haven't made it out of that yet. I think our, our peak ridership is still is still down compared to where we were before. And as you all know, the with the efforts to have people work from home, that might be a while coming before we see a, a full return in peak period ridership. On the positive side, when we look at on-time performance, Compared to 2019, uh, we were able, we improved across all routes. And in 2019, about 80%, which is continuing a trend. So 18, 19 was better than 18 and 20 has been better than 19. Um, and we're moving towards higher 
on-time performance across all of our routes. In 2019, 80% of our routes were below 80% on time. And in 2020, more than 80% of our routes are above 80% of, are on time more than 80% of the time when we look at uh, on-time performance throughout the day. And the way on-time performance is measured is by looking at the number of times that a service arrives at a, at a time point and whether or not it leaves that time point either early, late, or on time. And we just look at the percentage of, of observations and that's how we get to, to these on-time performance figures here. Last year, uh, the council asked us to look into peak period ridership specifically. And so when we look at on-time performance in the peak period, comparing 2019 to 2020, we see improvements there as well. Um, significant improvements in both the AM, but particularly in the PM peak period, which is where our on-time performance was the worst, which simple to understand. PM is also where traffic is heaviest. And so that's where we typically had our, our problems with staying on time. And in 2020, we made significant progress on both AM and PM periods. Um, we were helped in that by a number of factors related to COVID. One, suspending fares meant that you had less delay as passengers were getting on and off. We had fewer passengers getting on and off and the general background traffic was much less uh, during COVID. So we looked at, to get a sense of how much of this was, was driven by COVID, we looked at the on-time performance before March of 2020 and compared that to our 2019 ridership. And what the positive takeaway there is even the improvement in on-time performance predated COVID. We were able to see improvements in both the AM and the PM peak before, before COVID and those other changes which would have had additional positive impacts. Um, and so as we look to the future, we don't expect to, we expect to be able to continue our improvement in on-time performance. And we will be monitoring that as we, as we go from 21 into 22. And we're excited about the improvements we've been able to make over the last, the last two years on this, on this measure. So I wanted now to transition into current year initiatives. First, uh, there we'll be completing the State Street Alternative Analysis, which we started last year. We also will be kicking off the State Street Transit Operational Analysis, which will allow us to look at where, get uh, conceptual projects de developed along State Street, where we'll be able to build better passenger uh, amenities along the corridor, improve on time, excuse me, improve transit priority, as well as real time information to passengers. Uh, we also will be kicking off a study on the Fairview corridor, which will be looking at similar things to identify how we can improve the passenger amenities there and bring the Fairview corridor, begin to bring the Fairview corridor up to best in class status. We also will be looking to increase peak frequency on Fairview by doing some reallocation of poor performing services um, and, and doing that planning this year. We also will be building out, um, completing the, the electric bus infrastructure, taking receipt of our first electric vehicles and continuing that trend of electrifying uh, VRT transit vehicles. As I mentioned earlier, the CARES resources provide a great opportunity for us to be reinvesting in, in regional and local priorities. And 2021 will also uh, be focused on developing an implementation plan for, for a full build out of the State Street Corridor, which will include improving real-time information at bus stops, enhancing passenger amenities, uh, continuing to reduce travel time on that corridor, uh, making transit fare collection easier, and improving the, the bike and pedestrian improvements along the corridor. So that'll be a priority for us to build out how we will be reinvesting those resources and into realizing the vision for State Street. Looking a little bit longer term, uh, again, focusing on the best in class corridors and Beyond, we see 
our progress going beyond just 2022 uh, in terms of how long it'll take us to build out State Street and the other the other best in class corridors will be looking to improve all day frequencies as we heard from the public in in last year's outreach and generally bringing more improvements to the city of Boise and the valley with improved transit services. And with that, I would stand for any questions. Thanks, Stephen. I, I'm going to ask. Okay, great. It, it, there's a little bit of time for questions now. Um, I was thinking we might do all the questions at the end, but Bree and Karen need 15 minutes, so we've got a little time for questions now. Madam Mayor, uh, just a quick question. Yes, go ahead. Um, Stephen, thanks for the presentation. I was curious, uh, you said you had suspended fares during COVID, and I didn't know if they were still suspended now or if there's plans on when those would come back. So we started collecting fares again, I believe it was in October, We and we have been collecting since then. And then, uh, Madam Mayor, just a quick follow-up. Um, Stephen, could you tell if... There, was there any data that showed that not collecting fares? I know that we did it from a safety point of view. Is there any data that shows that it encouraged people to use it more, even though it was a complicated time to use public transit? Madam Mayor, um, there, yeah, there is a, we see an increase in ridership when we don't collect fares, yes. Uh, that's the shortest answer. If that has a follow-up question, um, as we've explored the implications of going fare-free, uh, we've tried to balance the additional revenue compared to the additional ridership. And you, you can get more service to more people if we continue to collect fares than we would get increased ridership by simply not collecting fares. Yeah, absolutely. I guess, do you know if the data in during COVID, during 2020, if the reduced fares, we know that it does that, you know, in general, do we know if it did it during COVID, if that played a role in continuing ridership or building ridership? It, we would have to look a little closer at that. I, I'm not sure what, um, we would need to take a closer look at that. It's hard to tell because ridership was down generally. We'd have to look kind of month to month on that to see if there was an additional decline in ridership after we started collecting fares. Perfect, thank you. Madam Mayor. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, I get a lot of time to talk to VRT, so if anyone else um, has questions, please pop in. I um, am particularly excited about the opportunity to utilize the um, benefit, if you will, of using the CARES funding for operations to build out the State Street Corridor. Um, Stephen, I was excited to talk to you uh, yesterday about how we might apply for uh, various funds to do that. I guess my, um, I guess my only comment there, um, your slide showed that we would focus on passenger amenities and um, station areas and those kinds of things. You and I talked yesterday about the importance of also working to get that third lane built out in the segment so that we get continuous uh, bike pad connectivity and access to the system as well as continuous operational um, service by the, the buses themselves. Uh, regardless of the need for that extra lane in terms of other traffic flow, um, the benefit it would be to transit. Uh, just wanted to make sure I got that on the record today. And if you have any comment about it, I'd love to hear it. Thank you, Madam Mayor, Councilmember Clegg. Um, yes, we did talk about that yesterday and made sure to include the importance of pedestrian and bicycle improvements in the, in the presentation today. Uh, and and could have included a reference to the sixth and seventh lane as well. Perhaps our team will be able to speak more deeply on this topic and, and what the city's proposing council president, if that's all right with you. That'd be great, thank you. Great, come on up.
Can you hear me? We can hear you. And I'm not, can people, can council members see Bree and Karen? I'm not sure what you see because I don't see them in a screen. Great. Okay. Then you're in the right spot. I wasn't sure. Awesome. I don't know if you can see. Oh, there you go. Okay. Uh, but Bree, yeah, bring it down a little bit so you're a little louder. I'm a little shorter. Uh, great. My name is Bree Brush. I am relatively new with the city. So if I haven't met you yet, I work in the mayor's office on transportation policy. So I spend a lot of time with our partners in this space talking about our transportation priorities. So that's what Karen and I will be here for today. As the mayor said, we'll present on some specific FY22 transit priorities. But first, a little background. The city established a memorandum of understanding with Valley Regional Transit in 2019 to establish the process for how we would provide consistent transit funding. You heard the first piece of that earlier from their development director, Stephen, and the other portion will be later this evening in your evening meeting for a public hearing. The contributions here on the screen are the last three years of our contributions. They are usually around eight and a half million but can vary a little bit depending on the year because they're tied to uh, property tax receipts. So this number usually amounts to 5% of property tax receipts. Next, I'll hand it to Karen and she'll go through those first two initiatives with you. So following up on what Stephen uh, was saying about State Street. And, and welcome, Karen. Oh, is that do I need to be that Oh, close? no, I was just saying welcome because oh, we haven't cool. seen you in here in, in a while. So it's nice <laughs> to see you in person. Thank you. It's, uh, it's, it's been almost a year and it's just very different to be back under um, just the new way we operate. So, but it, it's good to be here. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, our first initiative is State Street. So it's long been a city priority. As Stephen said, this is, we've got at least six partners that we're working on in State Street. And, you know, in a nutshell, why we're one of the reasons why we're focusing on State Street is without transit, we would be looking at nine lanes for that corridor to serve the needs that were projected years ago. So it's still just a, a transit is the best solution for this uh, corridor. Um, and as Stephen said, we've got this great opportunity with the CARES Fund since they've uh, covered the city's operating funds for the last year that we just got this opportunity to invest in the corridor. And we have been looking at the passenger amenities, um, real-time information, the enhanced uh, and branded shelters, um, branded service, hopefully with electric vehicles as we go forward and the routes, and then the level boarding and off-board fare uh, ability to pay for your fare. Um, I think uh, Council Member Clegg was bringing up the additional lanes. So we're, we're still at the very beginning of figuring out how big of a grant we want to go for and what's available for us. Um, I think the implementation time would be one thing that would be a consideration. Uh, upgrading the amenities could be accomplished sooner. It gets a little more complicated with the additional lanes, but that's still something that's um, on the board. And I guess if any of the council members have input on that, this would be a great time to take that input as well. So moving on to our second initiative is still, as Stephen was saying, best in class. So we've got the three routes. Um, we're focusing on State Street. We've already done some investment in the stops the, to enhance them on Vista with our Energize funds. Um, they're branded with uh, some of the Vista logos on the bike racks, um, and they've got art included as well, and many shelters. Um, there's still opportunities to add more shelters and upgrades on Vista as well. But what's lagging behind is definitely Fairview, at least even in the planning stages. So as Steve instead, in this coming year, Fairview corridor is one that we'll, we, we will be looking at as well. So just getting those shelters, benches, and bike racks really make a difference for riders, um, across the nation, they found increased ridership when their stops are upgraded. And as many of you know, that we have a, a sign for many of our stops and not many amenities. And so with that, I'm going to pass off the third uh, initiative back to Bree. Okay. 
Okay. That final focus area for us for FY22 will be an increased focus on how we can really maximize those existing transit investments. We know that finding transportation solutions is con a consistent concern for residents, and we have about the 5% dedicated each year to that cause. And you'll see on this, this slide here, that makes about 87% of VRT's local contribution budget. And for scale, you can see where that falls relative to our other departments. To help us meet our citywide transportation or citywide goals for improving information accessibility, we're looking to our partners at VRT to help meet those objectives and help us get a better understanding for how our investments meet those transportation needs. So our two budget teams have already begun working together to identify some performance metrics that we think would help deepen that understanding of our financial investment for VRT and track how we're meeting those goals. And that is all we have for you. I guess we didn't need 15 minutes, but I'll take any questions. Well, I just turned off my mic. This is great because now we have more opportunity for um, discussion or questions now in advance of the hearing tonight if council would like that. Council President. Go ahead. Sure. Oh, go ahead. If there's somebody else, that's fine. I don't see anybody else right now and oh, you unmuted okay. first, so go ahead. Okay. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, so I guess my, my biggest question is, um, as we move forward with this, given the atmosphere that we're in, knowing that um, we have a year where we're likely to have lower ridership, I guess, thinking back to the airport um, presentation, it seems like it's a tremendous opportunity to catch up a bit on some of these amenities in a time when um, it won't be quite as disruptive to the riders because there may not be quite as many riders. And um, thinking about that, either Bree or Stephen or Karen, um, as we, uh, one of the things I, I don't know if Stephen, I think you mentioned it, but I don't know if people caught was that in addition to the transit operations uh, planning that's going on on State Street, there's also a bus stop typology planning that's going on at VRT. My question is, from a timings perspective, when will that typology study be done and what kinds of um, things can we do to kind of um, expedite getting some of those bus stop improvements done in this year when we might have lower ridership? Madam Mayor, I would let Stephen jump in on that one. He'll have the specifics of timing on that. Great, go ahead, Stephen. Thank you, Madam Mayor, Councilmember Clegg. The bus stop typology is a study that we have scheduled to to occur this year. Uh, we anticipate it would be seven to eight months to complete, so it should be completed early part of 2022. And then just follow up. Um, I, I believe the planning is to follow up that typology study with improvements to bus stops based on our typical 39. 5339 formula or grants. Um, there's a competitive grant process also in 5339. Is, is that correct? Madam Mayor, Council Member Clegg, yes, that's correct. And so we'll, we will be working with City of Boise staff as well to develop a, when, when I mentioned that we would be working on having an implementation plan for the State Street build out, in 21, as an activity in 21, one of the key features of that is to look at how these planning efforts as well as um, capital construction and design would would play out over the coming fiscal year and and forward. So the, the opportunity that we see is to be able to fast track anything that comes out of our current planning efforts and to roll that right into construction as quickly as possible. So we could see some of those things starting to occur in 2022, yes. Great, so one more follow-up if I might, Madam Mayor. Um, Stephen, the reason I'm bringing this up is um, as Karen was speaking, especially in remembering the work that our um, Department of Arts and History and our Energized Neighborhoods did on the Vista Corridor, it seems like this is also perhaps a time that we could engage both of them early rather than waiting for Typically what happened on VISTA is that we waited for the neighborhood association to apply for reinvestment grants. 
And then we developed um, the artwork designs and the various things that, that enhance the neighborhood. And I just, I wonder if during this eight month planning stage, there'd be an opportunity to engage with both Energize and the Arts and History Department early so that we could get some idea about how to implement those um, elements into these improved stops. Madam Mayor, Councilmember Clegg, that seems appropriate. Great. Well, there'll be, if that's, is that it for now? More to come this evening? Oh, no. Councilmember Hallie Burton. Yeah, Madam Mayor, one more question. Um, so, you know, my brain's kind of, I think, at the same spot where Elaine's is, is like, what are, what are the infrastructure improvements that we can make this year that are, you know, slightly more, that might be disruptive um, in a year where things were quite a bit busier? And so if there are a way of prioritizing those types of things when we know it might be a slower year, I, I think that's something, something certainly worth looking into. Um, Stephen, I did have a question. You, you, you were talking about some of the ridership and you said that it had kind of turned into a bit of a hill instead of those peak times in the mornings and the afternoons. And I'm wondering if, that, if that's attributed to anything with regards to who's using the bus as far as the types of workers um, and their shifts, or if, if there's any information on why it's shaped that way. Council member, uh, great question, Madam Mayor, Council Member Halliburton. Um, the, I mean, without getting into a lot of really interesting transit sort of theory and um, the difference between riders in the peak period and, and the off-peak and midday is that you is typically the type of trip that it, that's happening and to some extent some of the demographics that go along with that so if you do have passengers who are working not your typical nine to five type of job you will see them riding at off hours uh, if you have somebody who requires who, who doesn't have a car you will see them riding at all different times of the day um, because we we don't just drive our cars you know to and from work, we drive our cars to lots of other places. And so there's long been this kind of bifurcation of the transit market to be you know, focused solely on a commute trip to the main, uh, the main employment center. And then the, the other side, which is just general transportation. And the general transportation side of things um, tends to be more robust, I think, over time. In, in terms of it doesn't it doesn't follow your boom and bust cycles quite as much because it's just general transportation. And I think we actually have seen some of that with our own ridership impacts through COVID. Um, we don't have a super heavy peak period service. I mean, we do have more peak service in the peak period than we do in the off peak, but a lot of our service is kind of more consistent throughout the day, which just we didn't have quite as far to fall, I think, is what I'm trying to get at um, with our with the COVID impact. And we saw, like I mentioned, Saturday ridership didn't didn't decline nearly as much as midday ridership. And I think it speaks to how people are using the service when they ride midday versus riding in the peak period. So it's been interesting to watch, and I think it highlights some of the differences between how people use transit and why it's important to a lot of different people. But um, that's, I think, another thing that the city of Boise has been pushing on in terms of getting a longer span of service to help facilitate people who can use, maybe the people who don't have a typical, again, nine to five type of job, but can, if they're doing swing shift types of things, some of our services don't operate late enough for the, to catch one end of that trip. And so um, we, with the city of Boise, have been working towards kind of an all day transportation as opposed to one that's focused solely on the peak period. Yeah. Yeah. Stephen, I really appreciate the, the clarity there. I think, you know, with these investments that we're making, like I said, I think I'm really on the same page with Elaine and, and what we can do this year. Also trying to make sure that we're still offering that services for the folks who have no other transportation options. And we're prioritizing that in a, you know, a couple of years that might be pretty tough as people kind of emerge and try to get back on their feet. So thank you again for the presentation. Thank you. Madam Mayor. Um, thank you, Stephen. So I have a question about the, the bus stops. 
um, as we know, we don't have a lot of the covered shelters or like the kind that you see in other cities that have the immediate updates about whether your bus is coming and, and the time it's gonna arrive. So as we're, as we're looking at the other typologies, the, the other versions, are we, are we looking to catch up or are we looking for innovation and making sure that we're at that cutting edge as we try to become more, more responsible and embrace public transportation as an option for more of our citizens? Madam Mayor, Councilmember Sanchez, um, we are looking to be innovative on how we how we roll that out uh, there. And it's exciting actually to think about um, because you're talking about real time information, be, making information available at the stop, which, you know, even just 15 years ago was largely only at rail stations and they were pixelated signs that didn't, I mean, were expensive and heavy and required a lot of infrastructure to make work. That has changed a lot in the last decade and a half, two decades. Um, and we would be looking to, we would be looking to provide the information in as economically way as we can so that it could get to as many different places across the region as possible. Um, and I think that there are ways to do that, that, that have a lighter footprint that could be powered by solar that, and, and that has both green impacts, but it also just has cost and infrastructure impacts. If we don't have to tie into the into the grid, then it makes things cheaper. It makes it easier to implement. And so we're, we definitely would be looking at um, those features as we develop that bus stop typology to determine how, how can we get as many of those amenities to as many different places as possible while making sure that our best in class corridors certainly provide that level of service. Thank you. Great, well, thank you, Stephen. I think we'll see you later this evening as well. Are Bree and Karen, are you with us as too? Well, we'll be here this after or this evening to give just a short introduction to great. the topic. Okay, great. More conversation this evening. Look forward to it and hearing from the public. We will recess until six o'clock. Thank you. Thanks all.